Hi, I'm Jenny Champeau. I'm the director of the Book of Mormon Art Catalog, and I'm here today with George Hanley. Dr. Hanley is a professor of interdisciplinary humanities at BYU. His creative writing, literary criticism, and civic engagement focus on the intersection between religion, literature, and the environment. Among his many publications are Home Waters, A Year of Recompenses on the Provo River, and If Truth Were a Child, which was published by the Maxwell Institute. Today we're looking at some verses um, from Alma chapters 30 to 31. And the painting we're looking at is by the artist Walter Rain, and it's called All Things to Note There is a God. Um, Walter Rain did this in 2003, and you're probably familiar with it. It showed up in the Come Follow Me Book of Mormon manual in 2020, and also again um, this year in 2024. Um, George, first of all, can you just tell us what's happening in this painting? Who are the figures and, and what's going on? What's the story here? Uh, yeah, sure. This is a, a beautiful and compelling image of Alma talking to Korahor, uh, presumably at the very moment where he is uh, appealing to Korahor to say, look, you've already had enough signs. Uh, mm -hmm. Korahor has asked for a sign, says he will believe if he can have one. And he says, you know, he mentions the prophets and the scriptures, but then he says uh, uh, the heavens uh, essentially also mm -hmm. denote that there is a God. And he's uh, obviously here pointing to the heavens. We have the stars in the, in the distance. Uh, Korahor is uh, curiously not refusing to look. Yeah. Uh, and he's also, most of the painting, of course, well, half of the, land, uh, the image is blocked. The sky, the sky is blocked by the wall of a, of a, of a man-made structure so that, you know, this kind of two-thirds of the image is sort of this man-made world that he's mm -hmm. trying to get Korahor to look beyond oh, into, yeah. the, into the heavens, and, uh, but he's refusing. I think that's kind of curious. It is, and I, I noticed, too, this really open posture of Alma, um, the way his hand is extended. He's got one, like, one hand to his heart. And then Korahor has this very closed, um, hunched over kind of like posture, and like you notice grabbing onto yeah. the wall. Even it seems very fearful to me. He it, seems like yeah. he's actually afraid to to look because maybe if he did, something very different would happen in, uh -huh. his, in his mind and in his heart. Mm -hmm. Do you think? I mean, the idea of proving the existence of God by looking to nature is that's kind of it's more complicated maybe than it seems at first glance. Is is that something that, like, what do you think about that idea? <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because I, I think there's un, undeniable for me, you know, on an experiential level when I'm in the natural world, I can't help but feel God's spirit. I can't help but feel mm -hmm. his presence. I think uh, Doctrine and Covenants 88 describes it as beautifully as anywhere in scripture about the, the light of Christ being in the light of the stars and the light yeah. of the moon. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's sort of a, a nice yeah. uh, appendage to this. To this verse, but I think it's it actually is misleading to say that uh, all things prove there is a God, and, and all things denote that there is a God. Maybe as a, as a subtler position, but I think uh, early on, Christian scientists were motivated to try to prove God's existence through the natural world, and they looked for ways of interpreting the natural world for that proof and unfortunately they ran out of uh, proof okay. <laughs> or they and they also kind of misread nature uh, oh. as a result because they were trying to make nature conform to a human conception of the world and I think that that mm -hmm. kind of pride is actually what Korahor is dealing with he has his own definitive answers to the nature of the world and he won't open himself up to wonder and to curiosity and mm. to even a sense of mystery which yeah. is I think what I feel mm -hmm. uh, when I'm in the natural world and what we tend to find opens us it breaks mm -hmm. us it, it it humbles us and it and it uh, heals us mm -hmm. but I think if we you know look at nature I mean this is the same thing when we you know listen to beautiful music or uh, try to engage in in relations with our family and friends if we're try constantly trying to rest things to make them conform to our idea of what things should be mm -hmm. uh, then we actually do more harm than good mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so I think he's I think he's not I, I don't I don't personally subscribe to the idea that if I look at the stars I'm gonna know with definitive evidence that God exists mm -hmm. 
Um, but with the eyes of faith, I can't help but feel his presence right. in, in uh, under the stars or in lots of other places. And I actually think most human beings on the planet yeah. feel that. Yeah. You know, I really think even if they don't call it God, they know that they're they feel healing. They feel enlightened they feel connected to something larger mm -hmm. themselves when mm -hmm. they open themselves up to the natural world so all of us could stand to mm -hmm. move away from the man-made <laughs> yeah. world from right. time to time and really yeah. experience wonder and 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 sort of a sense of awe in the yeah. in the many many creations god has made that don't necessarily mm -hmm. make a lot of sense to our minds right yeah. um but you know, I, I think it's a, anyway. I think it's <laughs> just a bit of a simplistic take to say sure. that you can prove anything. Yeah. Uh, but I like I like what you're saying, and it it makes me wonder. Since you're saying a lot of people, whatever their background, might feel that sense of awe and wonder in the natural world, and that makes me think, well, maybe God intended it that way. And why why do you think God would want us to have those recurring experiences of awe and wonder in the natural world? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I th I think it, uh, you know, and I, I I have a lot of thoughts about that, but I think <laughs> I would say, I, for one, it causes a kind of striving and a yeah. yearning, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you 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 know, if God if God just made Himself palpably present yeah. in 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 my life uh, without any exercise mm -hmm. of my imagination, mm -hmm. without any exercise of my faith, yeah. Uh, I actually don't think I would find that very meaningful. Mm -hmm. I know that sounds weird, but I think that's actually what happens in the scriptures when mm -hmm. Laman and Lemuel see an angel and it yeah. doesn't actually change their hearts. Right. I think there's something in, um, inherently valuable about yearning for God and striving for God. And sometimes mm -hmm. in the natural world, I feel very, very small. Right. And God doesn't necessarily feel like he's right there with me, mm -hmm. um, but I still feel that there's some value in that. You mm -hmm. know, Moses witnessed the creation, and one of his significant reactions was he realized that man was nothing. Right. Um, and I take that to mean he didn't decide that man, human beings, are insignificant or meaningless, mm -hmm. but he discovered that he's not the center of the world. Yeah. And Job had to go through the same thing. God gives him a big, long lecture about the mm -hmm. stars and mm -hmm. all the plants and animals of the earth that he knows nothing about. And he's trying to get Job to say, to realize that maybe your story isn't the center mm -hmm. of the universe. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're not the most important person that yeah. ever lived. And right. maybe your suffering would be lifted if you let go of your need to make yourself the center. Oh, that's interesting. And also maybe that feeling that smallness in the natural world um, makes us right yearn for God and, and be open to mercy and grace, right? Yeah, yeah. Because I think in the end, um, nature can sometimes feel very indifferent to us, sure. and it can make us. It, it can be very frightening. Yeah. I remember yeah. backpacking as a young boy in the Tetons, mm. in true wilderness for the wow. first time in my life, mm -hmm. and I remember thinking. This place doesn't care that I exist, you know, like, and this place <laughs> yeah. has been around far longer than I've ever lived and will be far longer than I ever will. Right. And that made me feel very almost frightened. Yeah. But then when you when you feel that smallness and you learn humility, yeah. when you appeal to God and he does touch you. Mm -hmm. Boy, that you know that feels so much more healing. I mean, if God's just that easy to access that I put a quarter into a vending machine and get him, <laughs> right? Uh, then I don't think I would appreciate the gift of his of his spirit. Yeah, interesting. I want to just read a quote from some of your own nature writing. This is from Home Waters, um, and you said, um, "The divine has place in the very stuff of our physical existence." Um, could you tell me more about that? Like how, how do you see God in our physical existence or in the world around us? Yeah, I think the, the theology of the restoration is unusually clear mm -hmm. on this uh, compared to uh, the rest of uh, the Judeo-Christian tradition because we have three restored accounts of the creation from Joseph Smith, the Book of Moses, the Book of Abraham, and the endowment ceremony, mm -hmm. they make it very clear that there's a spiritual creation before there's a physical mm -hmm. creation, that plants and animals are living souls. Yeah. 
And that again, it doesn't, it's not obvious what it all means all the time, but I can't help but feel that I'm among divine beings when I'm in the natural world. I can't mm -hmm. help but feel uh, a divine presence in the physical world. And of mm -hmm. course, we place great emphasis on the experience of the body, not mm -hmm. only as a temporary thing, but mm -hmm. actually as our eternal yeah. destiny, and that the earth is actually the site of the right. highest kingdom of God. Yeah. I mean, we, we place a huge <laughs> premium on physical experience as a vital pathway to the spiritual. And I think mm -hmm. if you bypass it, yeah. you're not getting it right. You know, if you ignore the gifts of the body and of the earth uh, as if it's all there for you're taking it for granted or it's all nothing but dead matter or resources uh -huh. to be used and you don't know how to experience beauty mm -hmm. um, and, and pleasure in the body and in uh, the earthly context we're in, I think we're missing a big part of why we're here. D yeah. Section 59 of Doctrine and Covenants makes it very clear that God takes pleasure in our pleasure. Mm, yeah. He yeah. wants us to relish his creations and to yeah. feel awe and wonder and, and aesthetic pleasure in the color and the sound and the smell and the touch yeah. of the world. I completely agree with you. And in, in your book, Home Waters, <clears throat> it's, it's a memoir of sort of your year spent fly fishing on the Provo River. I'm a fly fisher also. So I know that. I, <laughs> <laughs> I loved reading yeah. the book and I loved um, the, the experiences that you had and the thoughts you had. And, and you talked about one day when you were catching a bunch of fish and, um, and the, the bright colors, the, the yellow and the pink and the blue markings on them. And um, you said they were, um, extravagant and superfluous. And I loved that, um, that consideration of the natural world, that like so much of it is extravagant and superfluous and I think is there for our joy and yeah. just shows um, the like abundance of God's grace and, and his, the abundance of, of his just gifts to us and, and that he wants us to, like you said, enjoy our bodies and the natural world. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now that's uh, uh, thank you for that. Yeah. And I, I, yeah, I do. I do feel. Um, I mean, obviously, if I looked at it biologically, I could say, well, there might be an evolutionary explanation for this, <laughs> that, and the other. And those are pretty fascinating things to mm -hmm. learn too. And they fill me with awe. Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily make God more remote to my mind mm -hmm. at all. Um, but I do think, even in the science. Mm -hmm. Uh, the best thinkers uh, in science today understand that it is a little bit dangerous to try to reduce everything to an explanation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that there is uh, a, a sort of mystery in the um, superfluousness or extravagance of nature that I think is at the heart of our experience of it. Mm -hmm. that, that I, um, so I don't, I don't you know, I don't see science as necessarily taking away all the magic, mm -hmm. um, uh, but I do think it's it's okay to not know all the explanations that are out there and still appreciate yeah. um, beauty whenever it's made available to you. Yeah, thank you. Anything else you want to add about these scriptures or this painting? Uh, I just think it's a great invitation to pay attention to the world, pay attention to the creation. And, and, and to pay attention, you really have to stop paying attention to other things like your phone <laughs> yeah. and, you know, your day to day mm -hmm. preoccupations. I think mm -hmm. we all need to be still enough once a day to just really look at the creation. Just this morning, I was reading my scriptures on my back patio. And a hummingbird was feeding oh. in my hummingbird feeder, but he flew over. I thought he was going to hit me in the face. He came so close to me, like he was saying thank you, and then he flew off. But he just paused right in front of my face, and I started weeping. I don't oh know. Gosh, it's just yeah. so beautiful. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. I'm, I'm just, I just think if we pay attention, mm -hmm. gifts are suddenly abundantly available everywhere. Mm. Thank you so much. And you bet. Thanks for talking with us. You bet.